Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to be talking about digital meditation, improving sustained attention. We have Dr. David Ziegler joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thanks so much for coming on. Of course, yeah, happy to do it. Really excited for this. It's been a while since we met about three-ish years ago. We Seems were, like it, yeah. Yeah, we were coming into the Neuroscape office to look over the technology that we had this, you know, on HoloLens, we had this meditation, um, uh, application and it was really cool to be using augmented reality technologies working um, exploring working with you guys at that right. time yep. and you were still building Metatrain and now you actually have it published in nature human behavior um, right. I'm so excited to be showcasing a demo with you today for those that don't know David Ziegler's background he's director of multimodal biosensing at Neuroscape and associate professional researcher in neurology at UCSF one of his latest projects, Metatrain, improves sustained attention in young adults through digital meditation in partnership with Jack Cornfield, Adam Gazelli, and Zynga. And you can find the links in the bio below to David's Neuroscape profile, as well as the Metatrain profile on Neuroscape, and the full paper in Nature, and David's Twitter and Neuroscape's Twitter as well. All right, David, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? <laughs> well, complicated, right? Complicated, confusing, a little bit worrisome at times but still hopeful. I mean, today, I, you know, I just heard in the news, we have new leadership in England, right? So big changes there where, you know, it, th these things are, are concerning, but at the same time, I think that, you know, we, we're, we're at a point where we're making all this amazing progress in science and technology and medicine. Win? Did Boris win? Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a complicated time. So I think that, um, but, uh, you know, while a lot of things are worrying in the world, I just, you know, as sort of a scientist and somebody doing, you know, um, medically relevant research, you just kind of have to forge ahead and hope for the best. So, What are the main principles you think we can embody to help our trajectory be on a more positive direction? That's a good question. I think, um, well, I, as a scientist, again, I, you know, I come back to as close as we can get to ground truth, right? Really looking at data, believing in data, believing in that there are actual, you know, um, quantifiable, falsifiable things that are real in the world. And we have to figure out what, are, what things are real and what aren't real and stick to the stuff that is real, right? I think that that's, uh, that's one of the most worrisome, you know, sort of trends that's, to me, happening in the world right now that we're ignoring truth. Right. Yeah, it used to be that we would tell stories to our tribe because of inclusive fitness to help yeah, each other. Yeah, and now exactly. there's stories being told rampantly for <laughs> self-dealing purposes, yeah. um, propaganda, misinformation, exactly. all these types of things. So we need that inclusive fitness on a global level again. And technologies I agree. I agree. like Metatrain help people feel the interconnectedness. It, it, well, it can. There's a debate about that, right? So that's one of the things we approach this at, you know, as you said, I, I work at Neuroscape and that's a center where we're very much um, trying to bridge neuroscience and technology because we think that we can use technology to bo both understand the brain better and also improve brain function. But at the other, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a debate raging about whether technology is good or bad for society, right? So we think, and you know, as we'll get into some of the technology that we've developed, we think that if you apply it in the right way, you can actually improve you know, brain function, and then also you know, this will have sort of ripple effects to society more generally. Yeah, there's that two, the two perspective on neuroscience plus technology. The, the one is everyone's using the smartphones and the laptops and the dings, booms, right. beeps, taking us away from the periods of sustained focus on, mm -hmm. the, right. on the creative endeavoring that we want to pursue. And then there's technologies like Metatrain that get people deeper into those states of, of, of sustained attention yeah. and interconnectedness, unity, these types of feelings. So how can we limit the ones that are distracting and increase the ones that help us flourish? Yeah, or at least balance them. Balance them right. better. Yeah, fix some of the business plans, the, corru <laughs> the corrupted business plans with right. the bad ones, yeah. Okay, let's talk about your journey. Um, sure. wh yeah, where were you born? Mm -hmm. Where were you born? Uh, Michigan. In small Michigan. Small town, southeastern Michigan. And then who were you growing up in the small town in Michigan, how'd you get interested in neuroscience? 
Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, growing up and, and when I actually first went to college, I wanted to be anything but a scientist. So I was adamant that I would not want to go into science. In my head, for some reason, you know, I had equated like science with going to medical school and doing this very sort of traditional journey. And I didn't want, you know, I, wanted, I was sort of rebelling against that in a way. And um, so I started off as, you know, college as a German and history major. Um, I actually, I took my first neuroscience-based class my freshman year, and the idea was I was going to take this, it was called Biosocial Dimensions of Behavior, and I thought it would be an easy way to get my science credit out of the way. Lo and behold, the professor was amazing and inspired me, and I fell in love from that point on with how the brain controls behavior, so I've been trying to figure that out ever since. So, massive switch, you know, yeah. after my uh, first semester, but... Yep. Whoa, what a what a pivotal moment in life yeah. trajectory, yeah. having a really good professor, getting really excited about exactly. the brain and behavior. Yep. And then, so then what about, that led you, the PhD was at MIT. Mm -hmm. yep. And so what, how did that then get you inspired? Because the, the was the PhD on this unmasking neural mechanisms that account for age-related changes in cognitive control? Yeah, that was pretty much my, okay. my thesis for, for my PhD. And so. like, let's, yeah, let's talk about that for a little bit in those cognitive neurotherapeutic interventions. So the, the neurotherapeutic piece didn't come until more recently when, okay. I, when I came here to UCSF. What I did is, as a graduate student in my, my PhD training was really basic. I mean, not entirely basic research, but more largely basic research, trying to figure out um, what kind of brain, brain changes happen as people get older. Also, I did some work with um, patients with Parkinson's disease, trying to develop new um, MRI technologies to see what's going on in the brains of these patients and difficult to image areas. Um, and then, you know, from there, I came out here to, San, that, that was in um, Cambridge, Boston, uh, and then I came out here for my postdoc with Adam Ghazali, and um, it was sometime in that first year we really sort of started transitioning from basic research to more what we call translational research, so taking the stuff that we learn from basic research and trying to apply it and turn it into some sort of therapeutic, and that's kind of what I've been doing ever since. We still have a very important basic research program but we're always looking for those um, new ways to, to use both neuroscience and technology to come up with these translational applications to try to help people, which is really nice. Because you know, I, I often felt as a grad student, it was, you know, curiosity was great. And I, you know, I could, there's tons to learn about how the, the brain changes as people age. But you know, for much of that, the story is kind of a negative one, right? So there are a lot of bad things happening. And we didn't have a lot of good advice to tell people how to you know, improve their function. And now it's really nice to kind of be sort of on the flip side of that where that's the focus, right? Trying to help people improve brain function when they have difficulties. And what would you say is then a, um, one of these core ideas of how the brain, what happens to the actual neurophysiology inside the brain when the age-related changes are occurring as we're getting older? Yeah, sure. what's, what's going on up there? Well, I think, it's hard, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. But there's definitely an issue of sort of noise in the system. So a lot of what the brain does is what we call sort of signal detection. Um, there's a signal detection theory. But a lot of what the brain is doing is picking out signals amidst noise, right? And you want the right signals. Um, that becomes harder and harder as people get older because the, the sort of tuning of neurons and, and neural communication, um, there's a lot of noise that gets introduced and it becomes harder to, to sort of find that sharp distinction between signal and noise. So you get, part of that is you get more distracted by noisy things you know, in noisy environments, right? Because there's tons of noise. So. Um, one of the big things that, that, we, that we focus on now is helping people figure out how to really hone in on the signal and avoid the noise, right? And there are a lot of different techniques for doing that. Some of them can be behavioral techniques, some can actually be sort of neural techniques, you know, in training uh, different rhythms in the brain and trying to improve that as people get older because those, those rhythms that are important, this is something we actually we studied in the, in the Mediterranean study, um, they can get a little fuzzy as people get older as well. So trying to fine tune those is another way of potentially improving that. 
process. So then as we get older, there our ability to take in our neuroplasticity is on the decline as in some ways well, as we get older? So that's, that's an ongoing, there's an ongoing debate about that. It used to be, say, 30, 40 years ago, um, it was really thought that plasticity or the, you know, the ability of the brain to change only happened when, when people were in their you know, developmental period, so adolescence, through maybe young adulthood, and then there was largely you know, a sort of um, complete loss of plasticity. We now know that brains are plastic throughout until the day you die. Right. That's mm -hmm. the, that's when plasticity but ends. But easier at but it, it is harder. Or yeah, to learn it core does. It gets yeah. it gets yeah. more difficult. But that's one of the things you know. One of the one of the things that we're really pushing on. If we find really engaging mechanisms, or try to find really engaging mechanisms to really push the plasticity when it yes. gets harder, yes. it's still possible. There's still a lot there and that, that can, can be done. Potentially offset some of those neurodegenerative. Exactly. Yeah. issues that arise. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a very interesting thing. It's like the more that you practice really uh, tough cognitive exercises, especially mm -hmm. in the um, in your 30s and 40s and 50s, the less likelihood you'll have of having the onset of neurodegenerative diseases. That's a very, in like yeah. don't just do the same repetitive activities. Um, do things that ch are challenging, do things that are new, do things that move you outside of your comfort zone and you'll um, be able to think better, live longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We call that there. cognitive reserve. So yeah. you build up this sort of bank of cognitive reserve or brain reserve too, right? So because everything cognitive or behavioral comes from the brain. Um, so yeah, the idea is if you bank a lot of that when you're younger, as things decline later, you'll still have this buffer that will help you deal with, with some of that. But it, you know, it also needs to continue as you get older too. So Yeah, yeah, build up the cognitive reserves. Yep, exactly. I love it. Yeah. love it. Okay, so then let's do, um, your, okay, so you actually had uh, the back, the, the interest spans through mind-body approaches, meditation, yeah. yoga, um, other neuroplasticity-based interventions to improve cognition and well-being in general. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense, because this kind of leads us into the, what is this, this closed loop digital meditation. Right. So how long has it been right. then? Yeah, how long has it been with MetaTrain now building yeah, this up to now? Yeah, it's crazy. I think from the point where we started building the app uh, with the folks at Zynga um, to publication was just over four years. So yeah. For the first study. We have, we have a, you know, several other ongoing studies and, and studies that have wrapped up since then. But for the first one that we're talking about today, yeah, about four years. So yeah, it's a uh, delayed gratification <laughs> yeah, situation. It is, it is, it is, yeah. <laughs> you really yeah. have to. They don't tell you that about science, but it's like you really have to be okay with delayed gratification. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the I, so the idea is that um, you can take a concept and um, that can usually take again this long amount of time. You have to make a form a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You have to come up with the way that you're going to try and prove it through, especially when you have to make something yeah. digital that right. then people right. have to interact with. Um, and then control for all the other variables in the experiment, and then right. and then there's actually doing the the design and the engineering of it, and yep. the, and the yep. getting the people in to, to do the testing with it over time. It has exactly. To, yeah. 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 This is this is tough it's, stuff. Okay. All yeah, right. Yeah. So so then. Um, okay. So then a couple years ago, you guys were in the process of working with um, Zynga on taking what was in your idea and designing right. it, and engineering it. And then you were piecing together the right peop the people to come in for this randomized control sure, yeah. test. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then now, now, yeah, walk us through the process of then um, what is going on with the people that are coming in? What are they doing are they, to yeah. improve their sustained intention through digital meditation? We have this demo to, to yeah. show. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me back up a little bit and like talk about sort of the rationale behind why we even yes. went down this road. Let's do it. Um, so we we were you know again we're we we're a cognitive neuroscience group and we're really interested in mechanisms of attention. So how the brain pays attention. Um, traditionally, or up until sort of before the the area when we era when we started this um, meditation program, meditrain program. Um, a lot of what we studied was what we call external attention or externally oriented attention, paying attention to things in your environment, right? And from, from sort of a science perspective, those things are easy to manipulate. We can flash lights and we can make noises in the environment to try to distract people and, and divert their attention from someplace. But 
we really got in, in, um, interested in internally oriented attention as well, right? So directing your attention to things that are going on either inside your own body or your thoughts and the process of how people got distracted from those as well. So maybe you're, you know, if you're tuning in to the, this, this, um, this broadcast right now, but you're also trying to think about what you're gonna make for dinner tonight, you're, 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 you're sort of either multitasking or engaging, in, you know, having some sort of distraction. So you have this internal distraction. Um, as we, you know, began to study this, we wanted to come up with a way to sort of help people train their internal attention to be more focused and less distractible, right? Um, but you know, as we were thinking about ways to do this, it was it became clear, right, that that we didn't need to reinvent the wheel, right? That there was this practice of meditation that's been around for for ages. Yeah. But the idea was to create sort of a um, a modern version of it in a te in sort of a you know a technological delivery system. Um, so we had this idea of, and also what we wanted to do, we've, prior to this, you know, we, we had been doing a lot of work with cognitive training games. So we, we have developed um, um, an earlier uh, publication from Neuroscape in, in Nature was on the Neuroracer program, Such which cool trained program. multitasking. Yeah. yeah. So we've lear we had learned a lot over the years about what makes engaging cognitive training programs. So the idea was, well, let's try to make sort of a meditation game, right, where we bring principles of neuroplasticity and cognitive training to the table and merge it with um, sort of age-old principles of focused attention meditation, right? So that was kind of the basis. Um, and so we had that idea, and we tried to build something on our own, um, which, you know, is fine. We have, we have developers. But then we did have this really nice opportunity to work with... It, Zynga used to have um, an arm called, a philanthropic arm called mm. Zynga.org, mm -hmm. whose mission was to create games for positive social change um, or, or positive social um, change, I guess. Is what the right happened way. to the philanthropic arm? Oh, I, I think it was a, uh, I, I actually don't know. It just ran out of funding, I think, uh, and, and sort of evaporated, unfortunately. That's yeah. Bad, yeah, I know That's it is really it's too, too bad. bad. Yeah, um, but they yeah they wanted to work with a project with, with us on a project, and we brought this idea to them, and then they basically pulled people who volunteered time from the company, you know, a few hours a week to put in on this project. So we actually had oh, this cool. whole team yeah. of professional game designers who were you know doing a giving a little bit of time, but um, it turned out yeah. So we ended up with a product that was. A lot more polished and you know more bells and whistles than we would have done if we were developing it you know just on our own at least with with our resources so it was a real treat to be able to do that so then taking so. some of these principles from even like the neural racer days yeah and yeah. then figuring out and even the meditation from from the origins of our species days <laughs> right right and then packaging those together in a way where you're like we're going to improve sustained attention right okay and yeah. working with zynga on the way okay mm -hmm. cool all right. All right, yeah, let's so, do this. So yeah, I mean, and then, as you said, um, I kind of got us off the, the track. We did this randomized controlled trial in, these, in healthy young adults. Uh, and the idea, to, the idea behind doing a study in young adults is more to sort of proof of concept, right? Young adults, if you think about it, for the most part, they're kind of at the top of their game cognitively, right? We don't, at least, you know, in terms of when we think of cognitive decline, it doesn't really happen until you get into like 30s and 40s and that sort of thing. Um, so th these are people who are doing really well, but at the same time, as we talked about earlier, we have these sort of you know, myriad technological distractions that are happening all the time. Media multitasking is going on constantly in this age group. Um, and they embrace technology to you know, the greatest extent ever, right, of any generation. So yeah. um, it kind of makes sense that you know, maybe this would be um, a type of um, delivery of meditation that would appeal to them and you know if we could then use that to improve attention that would be huge if we could see you know it, attentional improvements in such a young healthy group it's a big deal right because yeah. then if we can you know potentially take it to other populations who actually have impairments in attention we might even see you know compounded benefits you know much greater uh, impact
So that was kind yeah. of the idea behind you know doing a study in healthy young adults. What, and what was the age group of the healthy young adults? They were 18 to 32. 18 year to 32, olds. yeah. So, so like, it's like tech almost your whole life type people. Yeah. And, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and multitasking almost your whole life. And yeah. yeah. So if you can see yeah, improvements in sustained attention with them, then, right. yeah, then that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Okay, cool. All right, let's jump into yeah, the demo. Yeah, you want to see the demo? Yeah, let's yeah. do it. So we'll try to. All right, so this is. Okay, you can see it there. Yeah, the home screen here. And prior to any training, um, we have these, you know, sort of these instructions here, which are just how the, uh, how the app actually works. This is sort of nuts and bolts. Okay. One of the key things, though, is this. We, we did, um, we collaborated with Jack Cornfield, who's a, uh, a leader in uh, mindfulness training. He brought a lot of uh, Eastern techniques to the Western world. Um, and he worked with us on this. He, he developed a very short, about a five minute meditation lesson. We can hear a little bit of it here. Um, and so <clears throat> he actually narrated this, recorded it for the app for us, um, which was, was a real treat to be able to work with him. And he consulted all along the way in terms of like what, what aspects um, should be in here, what were the key things that, that should be in here in yeah. terms of the, 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 the actual meditation principles. We also in develop. You heard that narration, yeah. Ron? Okay, let's get. Okay, the, yeah. We'll get, let's play the narration then. During this training period, you cool. practice okay. focusing your attention on the natural rhythms of the breath. Okay. Using okay. the breath as a so way. So yeah, to and it goes on. It goes it's on. a okay. fairly traditional um, um, uh, approach to mind. Uh, um, sustained attention, focused attention, yeah. meditation. Focused yeah. attention, meditation, and then Jack yeah. does some of the narration or all? or Yeah, he, so he, this is about a five minute narration and then okay. that really sort of sets the stage and then the, the rest of the training, I'll, I'll walk you through sort yeah. of what a person would do um, as they go through there. Um, when, they, when they enter into the app um, for, for their actual training, they would go and we have, of course, we're scientists, we ask some survey oh, questions have you consumed about consumed caffeine. <coughs> That's an important. You know, question. we want to. Yeah. yeah, we want to know true, how yeah. how uh, how, uh, how distracting how, how awake the environment alert are you is. right now? Yeah, yeah, how distracting is your environment? Yeah, if you're in a roaring loud place, you only slept a little bit of time, yeah. and you're caffeinated. I mean, that's exactly completely different. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great. So we yeah. collect those data each time, and mm -hmm. then they go in, and you can see down at the at the bottom of the screen there there are these tips. So each day they got a, a meditation tip. Again, we develop those with Jack um, in terms of, you know, things that, that would, you know, if you say went to a retreat or took a class with Jack, these are things that he would tell you during, you know, the course of your training as you sort of advanced. So this we try to build those in. Beautiful music. Yeah, really nice. It's that's, very important. That's Zynga, yeah, sort yeah. of setting the stage. The um, calming, relaxing very much. music you're getting ready yep. for a meditation. Yep. Ah, that's good <laughs> stuff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you're ready, when you feel settled, um, you know, we tell them, again, in Jack's narration, he gives sort of a process to go through to settle your body, find the, the, the position that works well for you for sitting, where you can sort of maintain a comfortable position for a, a little bit of an extended period of time. Um, one of the things that, that does differentiate this from a more traditional meditation practice is that we do kind of chunk it into smaller segments to make it, so for novices, we make it very easily digestible. So they're little chunks of meditation. And then as people get used to the practice and get more comfortable and uh, improve their attention, we extend the amount that they, they sustain, or that they engage in the practice. It's only a couple minutes to start and yeah, then it's exactly. Long. Actually, the, so they, they start with a five minute um, period, but it's broken up into, the, the first, um, trial is only 20 seconds. So we just yeah. ask them just 20 seconds, 20 seconds. On, which is actually really hard, it's hard. for most. Yeah, it's it's hard. even hard for me still. Yeah, so yeah. It's, Can yeah. you not wander your attention? Yeah. Focus on just your breath for 20 seconds. And yeah. we recruited people who were complete novices, right? So they had no yeah, experience yeah. with meditation yeah. whatsoever. That because that would have actually complicated things if we had people mixed in who already had a practice, practice or that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. So we were very okay. careful about that. Okay. So once you're settled, you go you're in to begin your first and session. When you the basic the idea time, is to sit with the, the tablet the in your hand, eyes closed. Okay. And this will go on for, I have this set up for a demo, so maybe 20 seconds. 
Right, and so after you hear the chime, after that was maybe 15 seconds, you just indicate with the button press whether you were able to maintain uh, your attention or not. So I'll say yes. Okay. And then... So it's self-reporting. It is, yeah. In this, in this version, we use self-report, which is actually, we, you know, we've had lots of discussions about this. Close your eyes and focus on your breath. Interesting. And then you go so, for another round and you do this. Yeah, I have this set four, as a very short amount for demo purposes. They would do they times. would continue yeah, that yeah. and it would be they, for five minutes they would continue those trials and then they would have a little break like this. Oh, okay. And then they would go back in for oh, okay. another five minutes. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so you do yeah. a couple of okay, so it's maybe about like yeah, twenty seconds or forty yeah, seconds per like, per trial exactly. where you say yes or no. Right. So basically, if your mind wanders even one time, then you say you didn't sustain your attention. Exactly. And then that's, that's where pretty, yeah. the, I know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's tricky. And then that's actually where the, the closed loop part of the equation comes into play. Uh, so we have these the algorithms. Yeah. If they say yeah. no. If they can't maintain their focus, we make it a little shorter. If they are able to maintain focus, we make it a little longer. Yeah. And we use a we use a sort of standard um, algorithm from the psychophysics literature that that adjusts it to keep people performing at about sort of seventy five to eighty percent, so that they they feel like yeah. they're able to do it, but it's still challenging, challenging them just a enough. little bit yeah. and pushing yeah. them, you know, each into day the flow a state. Further. Yeah, yeah, into exactly. Trying state. to get the end, but tailoring it to each person because yeah. some people just you know they're going to kind of hover down at pretty low numbers for a while until a while. they move until up. They build it up. Other yeah. people, you know, just kind of take off right away. So we yeah. we can very quickly in the course of say the first day or two, we sort of the algorithm tailors itself to where the person's at. And then from there, we just kind of gently nudge them up over the course of six weeks. So that's how long they ultimately yeah. train Six with us. weeks and daily? Five days a week. Five days and a week. Yeah, about, so we start at 20 minutes a day for the first two weeks, move to 25 minutes for two weeks, and then 30 minutes in the last two weeks. Yeah, per so day for five it, days. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Okay. So and not a ton of time, yeah. but it's, it's kind of yeah, comparable yeah, to sometimes. sort of a, you know, some daily meditation practices that people would have. Yeah, so. and self-reporting is an interesting part of this as well. In the future, if we can actually get the biomarkers for right, we've e talked about e this e years ago. Yeah, yeah, like yeah some yeah, of this yeah. stuff. But yeah, yeah, that'd be great. So that's I mean, there's actually a really interesting. We have a, we've had a debate amongst ourselves about this as well. Because you could use like the Muse headband things. You like could that, yeah. right, and and there are companies out there that they're out there that are trying to key in on be it neural signals or some some physiological signal of relaxation or being in an attentive state. I also have another collaborator at UCSF who's trying to do that with fMRI. So, you know, actually yeah. going into neural networks and figuring out oh, that's cool. can we predict whether somebody's in an attentive state or are they focusing on their breath or on another part of their body? And it looks promising. fMRI is pretty expensive, so that's not going to be an at-home technique. Yeah. But one of the things that we decided with this is that the introspection is actually a really important property of it. Learning to introspect, we think, is probably mm. an important part of this, as opposed to having an algorithm or, or you know, sort of a yeah, machine learning algorithm that does it for you and predicts where your brain is. Yeah. You learning to figure out where your attention is is something that people don't actually, it's a skill that they don't sort of yeah, normally yeah, yeah, have, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Usually it's just the monkey mind taking you around yeah, to different places. Exactly, exactly. And so if you actually, interesting. So the idea that you're even being aware of your own attention. Right. That in exactly. itself could be yeah. even more important than everything else yeah. that you're doing. And we, yeah. yeah, we think that that's a really critical component of this. And that was something, again, that came through conversations with Jack Cornfield about, yep. you know, like what, do we want this to be completely self-report? What level of reporting, you know, do we, um, there are different approaches, right? Do we interrupt people and ask them what their, what, where their focus was, or do we just kind of let this play out, you know, uh, at a self-paced way? And we, th we just felt, felt that that was closer to what uh -huh. sort of a more traditional practice would be like, and that um, that's really kind of the foundation, learning to be introspective about where your attention is. Once you can do that, then you can hone it and focus it to where you want it to be and, and avoid the distractions. Yes, yes. So yeah, we, it's kind of like advancing we, through your practice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're leveling up our ability to be in control of our own attention. Absolutely. Yeah. And is, yeah. 
is that is that all that we think is good to oh, show? Well, can, There's more stuff can... to show? Okay, in a moment, I just want sure. to say one more thing, because yeah. for so many people, I think it's probably most relatable with the way that we now have these habits mm -hmm. of, I mean, the technological devices have made the habits, I think, uh, a little bit more, we're, we're a little, we're overindulging a little bit more than I think we even used to. I think one of the sure. ma main overindulgences used to be things like food maybe, where you would yeah. go and just kind of like, all of a sudden you'd be at the fridge again and you'd be like, I'm not even, why am I here? Yeah. You know, and so then like, are you aware that you're being brought to the fridge and that you're going to eat yeah, food? Yeah, that's a really good, yeah. And analogy. like with yeah. the technology devices now, mm -hmm. it's, now it's like, you had a moment of solitude and before you knew it, you yes. were opening up a social media platform yeah, you on your it. phone. Right. You can't, yeah. and so are you aware that you're grabbing your device in your moment of solitude and opening up a social platform instead of allowing periods of free association yeah. Yeah. to occur? So yeah, those are probably the two most familiar, I think, for, for tons of people. So yeah. basically doing things like this, like Metatrain can get you to to, to be more aware of where your attention is going and pause. Yeah, as, right. Be more Absolutely. aware and pause and say, do I actually want to do that? And right. That type right. of stuff, yeah. That's and so valuable. Sometimes there are periods when you want to just sort of let your mind wander, right? That's where, you know, so it's, you, but it's, 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 it's again being in control of where, when and where you allow that to happen. Right. Being so in think, control yeah, yourself exactly. of when and where you want that to happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Let's, yeah, let's show. So yeah. just a few other things. You, so again, you know, you would, you would go through that for about 20 minutes a day. Some of the other aspects of the app are fairly, you know, we have a calendar for tracking whether you, you know, which days you <laughs> That's took so breaks. cute. The yin and know, yang is the... <laughs> very nice. Very, the days you very did nice it. little yeah. touch. Yeah. Um, the other really neat thing, which again really differentiates this from, say, traditional meditation practice, is that we have quantifiable metrics of your sustained oh, yeah. attention. Oh, cool. So, you know, when, when you, it, it, you know, if you go to a meditation retreat or to, um, to some sort of class, you might have sort of a sense for how you're doing, yeah, yeah, yeah. but here we're actually able to quantify it because we're, we're collecting the data. And, you know, this, you know, has never been done before in, in, within sort of a meditative practice. So it's pretty exciting to actually be able to see. And then this, this opens up new doors for feedback to people. And not everybody responds, you know, very, you know, in, in the same way to quantified feedback, but there is a subset of, of our population, especially 18 to 30 year olds, who are really into sort of the quantified self course, and collecting yeah, yeah. data about everything Thing. you know that yeah, they're yeah, doing. Yeah. And here we have data about their internal attention, which they've probably never, never seen, before. seen before. Yeah. yeah. So, so it can we find it can be very motivating to some people, right? To see like, oh man, I had a really bad day. What was going on? You know, what do I? What can I do in my next day of training to kind of try to improve that? Yeah. Or maybe I was having a great day that felt, you know, I'm really motivated to come back in the morning and do this again. So, so it's kind of neat to be able to do that. And then this is then final meditation time. So this is yeah. when the closed loop system figures so out where that. Where did they get that day? How long could they sustain long their could attention? They get? Because yeah. if you, you know, if you click no, then it brought your final meditation time exactly. down from 20 seconds to 17 seconds to right. see if you could make that happen. Yep. If you succeeded, it maybe brought it up to 23, 30, et cetera. Exactly. So that's how, what you're looking at. Exactly. Not yep. yes or no, but the final exactly. time. Yeah, yep. Okay. Yep. Perfect. And you can see, um, a, so a full day view, or full view, or a three day view. Yeah, so this is the okay. full view. This basically would sort of um, aggregate over time. So as you went through the full 30 days, you'd see 30 dots on here. I just kind of put this together before I came in for a demo. Gotcha. So, so you see just, the 30 dots yeah, over exactly. a full view. Okay, versus yeah. a three day view. So cool. So there's quantified self metrics. There's your nice little yin yang calendar for right, the days right, that right. You're, you're doing it. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, so then so those are kind the of basics. It, it's fairly straightforward. And, you know, again, I think I started off by saying we, we, we called it a meditation game. It's, there are principles of cognitive training games in it, but it's more of an app, right? So it, it really isn't. It's, it's, it's not gamified to the, to the point where we might do a future version of it that, that, that would be, but. And yeah. then what's the, um, what's the difference between um, what Metatrain is doing right now 
and what um, Calm or Headspace yeah, yeah. or any of the other players are, are doing? Well, a big difference is that we're really focused on the, the, the focus, uh, the sustained attention aspect of <laughs> yeah. it. Um, we don't really have, we, don't, we haven't built in a lot of the mindfulness components to it because um, we really wanted to, you know, we're, we were interested in sustained attention. So mm -hmm. we really wanted to, you know, have sort of a, um, you know, laser focus on sustained attention and what can we do to really, really target sustained attention. So we kind of took all the mindfulness stuff out of the, mm. out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Apps like Headspace and Calm really emphasize the mindfulness, which is a you know we think that they probably have complementary effects on the yeah. body and yeah. well-being. Um, so one of the but, but one of the interesting questions that we had, and again you know we we talked through this with with Jack Cornfield in developing it, is that you know a lot of um, a lot of the philosophy behind traditional Eastern teachings of meditation is that you really need to start with the sustained attention. Mm -hmm. And then from there, yes. you can build out to these other pieces. Like you can add the mindfulness much more easily. You can add compassion more compassion, easily. Open heart meditation. Exactly. Things, but yeah. if you don't have that Body sort stands, of yeah. folk, that, that sort of um, foundation of the sustained attention, those yeah, things, you can come things. at it from a different way, but yeah. it's much harder. At least yeah. that's the theory. Um, it's and like there will be a debate about sharpening, that, right? sharpening yeah. your ability with your attention exactly. first, and then right. you can go do all the other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And actually, right now we're building a, a second version of this app where it uses all the same sort of underlying nuts and bolts and algorithms, but is focused on training compassion as well. That's so, interesting. Yeah, that'll be we're cool. Building that right okay, now. Okay, so things yeah. like Headspace and Calm, maybe they don't have this. Maybe the closed loop. They feedback. definitely don't have the closed loop. So there's yeah. no me answering if I'm yes or no, exactly. sustaining my attention. There's no them changing my time from, right. yeah, based on how well I'm doing, yeah. these types of things. So that's more like you just click a button and then you just let the music play. Exactly. Or let or someone have guide a guided you. meditation, yeah. And, okay. Exactly. Okay, so that this is a big difference. And then, um, and before we get to just some of the other um, slides on the results, then is then one of the goals then to, for me to be able to download this on Android and iOS, yeah, for me to be able to use to increase so my sustained attention? That, I mean, ultimately, we would, we, we would love to have this become a commercialized app. We're, we're a research laboratory, research center, so we're not actually in the business of putting apps out to the market, mostly because you know, we can't support them at scale, right? So it's, it, we would have to have much more staff in order to do that. So right now, there isn't a way to download this. It's a research tool. Um, we're applying it to new research populations. And again, we're talking with people, you know, the idea hopefully would be to find some company that would like to license it and take it to market, right? And do all of that sort of work that we're not, you know, we don't have the expertise to do that. So unfortunately, there's going to be a little bit of a lag, but we would like to at some point see that happen. Yeah, I highly, in the near future. I highly recommend people watching right now to figure out who's the right person to <laughs> to license this as soon Absolutely. as possible. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And yeah, please yep. get this out. Help Neuroscape get this out as soon as possible into sure. the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a such an important um, tool that can. Uh, just help us gain our own um, sovereignty over our own attention and and and, and creative yeah, endeavoring totally. in the world. Yep. Let's um. Okay. So let's show the let's show the um, sure. the assets that we have. So, um. Okay. So we kind of talked about this a little bit. We it's went through the demos, yeah. background stuff. Okay. Cool. And so then the next one. So this is, I went through a little bit of this. This is just, you know, sort of the details of the study that we ran that was the, the most recent publication. So uh, we went over the, the, the amount of training. Um, the key thing here is, again, so these are healthy older adults. You see their average age is in the 20, 20, 20s. 20s yeah. um, and then they came in before and after the, that six weeks of training for an extensive um, selection of these sort of cognitive tasks so that we could really figure out what their baseline levels of attention, impulsivity, working memory, and distractibility were. And then we also did all these neural recordings. So we looked at the structure of the brain, the function okay. of the brain with EEG. Okay, so you looked at the f structure and function of the brain to EEG, okay, but then what are the normalized tests that people do for um, understanding 
uh, attention and working memory and impulsivity? Like, how do you? Sure. Yeah. What are those tests? Yeah. So. I'm imagining you like dangling a fruit in front of my face while I'm like trying to focus on something and I'm like, ah. <laughs> so it, it's, it, that is, it's a little more sort of fine grained than that. Right. So actually, why don't you go to the next slide? I think okay. I have a, yeah. So if you look on the left over here, this is one of these tests and we call this the, this is the test or it's a version of the test of variable attention. Tova. Tova. Test yeah, of variable. Tova attention and okay. um, and the basic it's a very very simple task right okay. so the idea is you have you're supposed to maintain your your gaze on that little cr that plus the, sign the in the crow, middle the plus sign okay. and you see a box flashing on either the top or the bottom of the screen okay in one version of the task the box flashes a lot and you need to keep responding until it flashes on the bottom and then you have to withhold your response. Okay, so what am I, am I pressing a button? Yeah, or? just a okay. keyboard. So, keep, oh, I'm pressing a space bar or something. Yeah, okay. space bar. Okay, okay. so then the box is flashing on the top and I'm pressing the space bar right. and then once the box moves to the bottom, I, I stop. have to withhold. Withhold, right. yeah, okay. But you've been okay. pressing so much, oh. so fast, that it's really hard. Hard to stop. And so if you press, that's a measure of impulsivity, right? You made this impulsive response because you, you, were, you were just kind of going with the flow. Oh, that's an interesting test. And then yeah. the other version of it is where you don't respond. You see lots of flashes, but you only respond to the, the time that it flashes on the bottom of the screen. So you're ignoring, you, it's flashing, flashing, flashing. Mm -hmm. You're not resp responding to anything. But every so often, only about 20% of the trials do you see it flash on the bottom, and then you have to respond. So that's really sustained attention, because you're having to attend to the whole thing while you're not doing anything, and watch for that one, that one time event. time yeah. that it's going to go to exactly. the bottom and click then. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. So, okay, so it, oh, interesting. It kind of it's does inverse, inverse, in a way. Yeah. And that inverse can, yeah, yeah, can yep. show you both. Um, sustained attention on kind of both these sides of sustained exactly. attention. Yep. Not doing anything and then doing it and then doing yep. it all the time exactly. and then stopping doing right. it. That's so interesting. See, these are these are cool tests. Smart, yeah, I mean, smart humans <laughs> out there think about these tests. Yeah, we spend a lot of time. So this is one that that has been around in the literature for a while. You know, it's a fairly standardized one. Some of the other ones that we we develop a lot of these tasks. Uh, I don't have an example of one that we developed ourselves in this slide deck, but uh, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is a, a highly controlled way that we can measure this cognitive process that we're interested in and see if it changes over time. So, you know, we do, we do a lot of the, the development of these and, um, I mean, you know, probably almost as much time is spent developing these tasks as developing these training apps and yeah. interventions. So yeah, yeah they're you, equally you, important. You got to make sure that all of the people that you're doing the um, randomized control trial with that beforehand you're doing a good job at understanding who who they are, how well they have sustained attention, Absolutely, how well they're working yeah. memories, because then you're trying to sh compare the data after MetaTrain. And, yep. Okay. And if you're not measuring the right thing, yeah, you're not yeah, going to know if it, it which we up, actually yeah. think that, you know, in the cognitive training literature, there are lots of null effects where people don't find big effects. And part of it is that maybe the, the training intervention that they gave was not nearly as engaging as the type of things we would develop. But also that I think a lot of times people are picking the wrong outcome measures, right? So they're just yep. things that have huge practice effects. So you know, it doesn't just be just by virtue of doing it twice, you're going to get better on it. So we spend a lot of time, you know, sort of piloting and debugging and figuring out what exactly is the right test of the process we're interested in so that we know if it does change. Interesting. So yeah. then you may have even had to do this uh, leading up to the oh, definitely. trial, yeah, like yeah, yeah. a bunch of times. So we take a humans. whole other sample of people who don't yeah. do an intervention, but they come in and they do these tests two or three times just to see just what are the practice effects? You know, what's yeah. the baseline level of change that we what's see? What's the baseline level of change? Right. Then you have to like subtract that baseline level of change. That's one way of doing, doing it. it. Um, we didn't do it in this study, but in this study we took what's called a, a placebo control. Yeah. So we had another group who did, who trained, uh, they did all the tasks and they trained with other apps that we thought didn't have any of the active ingredient of MetaTrain. They were just kind of off the shelf um, uh, apps that were, were similar enough and people reported that they felt they would they would likely improve their function or they'd get benefit from doing them, but we didn't think that it had any of that active ingredient in it. 
And then I think the, the one that so many people are, are used to um, is the delayed gratification of the marshmallow. <laughs> yeah, experiment. the marshmallow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these are really interesting that, that you have to develop these uh, measurements beforehand, for beforehand and afterward yeah. um, to make sure that, you're, that what you're doing is having a serious effect, yep, positive absolutely. effect on people. On the right-hand side here, yes. these are the, the data that we were probably most excited about. So again, you've got this task where you have the, the impulsive version and the sustained attention version. Because of what we were doing, um, we focused more on the sustained attention um, t uh, version of this, of this test. They did both. But so as we talked about earlier, young adults, top of their game, they're doing really well cognitively. We, so if you look at their performance on hitting the button, they're close to like, you know, 90, 95% accurate, right? It's what we call a ceiling effect. They, they can't really get much better than that. Whoa. But yeah, so we don't have a lot of room for them to change in terms of their accuracy, right? But what we can look at is this really key measure of consistency in their performance that we call, as you can see here, response time variability. So your response time is how quickly you press that space bar, right? When you see the 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 target event, okay, right? The target event, yeah. So you if you if you respond, usually we think of fast response times as good because you were quick to get the response, right? The faster the better. That's kind of like the Western view, right? So if you're pressing the button fast on some trials, it means you're sort of you're engaged and you're doing the task pretty well. But say you start thinking about something that aren't those little boxes on the screen. You know, you start thinking about what's going to be for dinner or, you know, all that traffic you had on the way in yeah. here and you're annoyed. And so you get distracted and now you have a couple of slow responses because you weren't completely on task. And yeah. then you get back to the task and you're fast again, but then you start mind wandering again and you get slow. What happens there is you have variability in your response time. You're fast on some trials and then you're slow and you're fast and slow. Yeah. But if people are consistently responding either fast or slow, or whatever their, their optimal speed is for the task, if they're consistent and they don't show these fluctuations from fast to slow to fast to slow, that we actually take as an indicator that they're sort of in the zone and they're really focused on the task and their mind isn't wandering to other events. And there's a lot of literature that sort of supports this idea. So the lower your variability in your response time, the, the more, more focused exactly, you are. Yep. And so if you look at the bars here, the black bars. Which actually bars, works with heart rate variability too. The lower the heart rate variability. It's actually the, the. The more focused, but the more, yeah, it's like the more, like the more fight or flight yeah, you are. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. It goes okay. down when you're in yeah. that mode. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then it, uh, the variability, uh, heart rate, that's uh, a complicated yeah, thing. <laughs> but yeah, it, it almost, uh, it's a little counterintuitive sometimes, but yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah, the less variability, the more focused here. Yeah, in this yeah. case, yeah. yeah. And what you can see, the, the black bars are the, the groups, so Metatrain is on the left and the placebo control here is on the right. They were pretty much matched before the training, but after training, the Metatrain group showed a significant decrease in their variability. So they became more consistent from moment to moment uh -huh. in their task performance. And okay. the other group didn't show any change. Got it. So that was really the, and then we actually, I don't think I have the other slide on here. Okay, but that's cool. So you learned that they increased their sustained attention through response time variability. Exactly. That they were more focused, they yep. were more consistent in yes. their response times. Okay. Yeah. And we actually found the exact same, find, the, the exact same um, effect on a completely separate task. So another task called the filter task where you have to uh, I don't have, I don't, I didn't put that one in here, but you have to look at different bars and sort of ignore things that are distracting in the, on the screen. So yep. it's a little more complex yeah. task, um, but you have to maintain some items in memory, filter out the distracting things and then respond mm -hmm. to, to whether there was a change and their response time variability decreased on that task as well. So it's kind of like a, you know, within the same group, we have this little replication on two different two tasks, different tasks, which well, really increases your, yeah. um, you know, the, the trust that you have in the finding. Yeah. Cause yeah. you have to store all of that information in working memory that you saw True. and then yeah. say whether or not anything changed. That's right. what, what exactly. is that one called? Uh, that was the filter task. It's called um, filter task. Filter task. Yeah. Cause you're filtering. The idea is you're filtering out irrelevant stimuli. Yeah, in the environment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, cool, okay. So then, they, they, so then they, they increased on both of these tests. Exactly. 
Okay, cool. Yeah. And is there something else about the bottom right? Also um, that we wanna... oh, there's just another way of plotting the data. So what you can see there is the response time sort of in the, in the gray bars, that's, the or the, uh, on the, that's after training. So you can see that peak kind of sharpens yeah. uh, in the Mediterranean group, but not the placebo group that pretty much stays the same. So that's just basically showing that they're mm. more consistent and they're sort of fine tuning their, their oh. stability of attention. So. Yeah. so you're training chimps to have improved attention. And the, good. the, it's good. the more, editors more and reviewers yeah. like to see data in many different ways. Many so reviews, that's why yeah, we have, yeah, yeah, we had like, yeah. you know, probably four more panels to this this graph in the paper if you when you go to the, the actual publication. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah data different ways. Okay. Right. All right. In the next one, I think. Yeah, and so these are this is just a little bit from that from the neural data that we recorded from the EEG data. Um, and so again we collected this electroencephalography where you put electrodes on the scalp and you measure the, the sort of underlying electrical activity of the brain. And one of the ways that you can um, quantify this is in terms of different brain rhythms. Yeah. Uh, and I think I mentioned we talked about this toward the, toward the intro to the interview. One of the rhythms that's really important for attention is this theta rhythm. So it's a four to seven hertz oscillation. So the idea is if you have neurons that are active, all active together and then they're all silent and they're all active and then they're all silent, that can take on a sort of periodic function or a, a rhythm. Mm -hmm. So like a sinusoidal wave. Mm -hmm. And so you can fit the waves to that and you assign it a different frequency, in this case, four to seven hertz. And so you can kind of see that over on the, on the yeah. left. You see the okay. frequency is on the, on the y-axis on the far left. And then you have over time here, you see on the, on the x-axis. Yeah. So it's a time frequency plot. And you can see this sort of big block of four to seven hertz activity around two to 300 milliseconds. And, what, and then that, what does that indicate? And so that's indicating, that's about the time when we think that people are really paying attention to whether the target happened or not mm. and deciding to make a button press. Yeah. So okay. it's the point at which they're either you know, committing to their button press or not. Okay. And so if they're really focused, we should see, we think, and the, the sort of literature backs this up that there should be more of this theta oscillation in these frontal regions here. So this is the front of the brain. Um, uh, you can't see the back of the brain. Interesting. But basically you were seeing in sort of the lateral or side frontal areas and also the medial or middle frontal areas, this increase in the, the theta synchrony. So do we think that the at any time of sustained attention that we should see theta synchrony in the frontal lobes? It's, we, this is about the, the, well, it varies from task to task, but you should see it at some point after the visual system. So you have, this, uh, this was a visual task. They're seeing things on, on, on a computer screen. Mm -hmm. So the visual information has to go through the eyes to the, the visual cortex. So you have low level processing that has to be done. Then a little bit later, about 200 or 300 milliseconds later, is when you, we expect to see some of these higher order centers engaging to make some sort of decision about the task. So you really, you wouldn't expect to see this really early in like the first hundred milliseconds because yeah. the visual system is still taking in the information and, and sending signals Signal up to up, so. higher level brain areas. Yeah. Then they, they engage and if they're, if they're attuned to the task and they're attending, you should see this theta at that point. Okay, okay. And so one of the interesting, so the, the theta rhythm itself is, is, is great and important, but the particular way that we measured it is, um, yeah, I do have it written out here, is what we call intertrial coherence. And so coherence is just synchrony or synchronized um, oscillations. But this is, was really important because basically what this means is that the, the alignment of the start of the theta oscillation is from trial to trial as they're going through this task, it's becoming more consistent in the people who did Metatrain and not in the people who did the placebo. So that's what the, the bar graph is showing. Your coherence is increasing. So this the is coherence of the from, uh, of, the in the, of the rhythm. Of uh, yeah, the, the rhythm. start of the rhythm is becoming uh, more consistent. That, so that's the inner trial coherence. And basically, it's kind of like a neural analog to increasing your moment to moment or decreasing your moment to moment RT variability. Okay. So it's kind okay. of like, we think that these are very, very similar processes. So this is, okay. you know, what we think is the underlying neural mechanism. So 
by the, you know, behaviorally we see that people are more consistent in their performance, but also in the brain, this, this theta oscillation is becoming more consistent from trial to trial in sort of the same way. Interesting. Okay, so before there was more dissonance in exactly. there, and then, then you got coherence towards this theta oscillation. Yes. That's, you think, the neural yeah. underlying um, physiology at least of one sustained of them. attention, yeah. at least one yeah. of them. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's the main data. There are a couple other okay. things in there, but, you know, we can, um, those are kind of the really take, the big take home messages from, from that one. And then what's this one? Yeah. Yeah, this one is just a different way of looking at EEG data. It's what we call an ERP or event related potential. Um, and it's basically instead of looking at the oscillations, it's kind of just. What's P3B? <laughs> yeah, that's you, a that's a, um, a a bit of a complicated one. Yeah, you but guys are so. I know. Funny. We, um, this is this area. It's like the DLPFC. When you when you break it down, it's actually pretty easy. P means positive. Okay. Three means it's at three approximately three hundred milliseconds. Okay. And B, it, there are different. So there's a P3A, which yeah. happens early in the 300 okay. millisecond window and then a B that happens late in the 300 millisecond window. So positive 300 millisecond and happening a later. A little later, yeah. Uh -huh. ERPs are, you have, I mean, you, people spend lifetime studying all these different, different event, um, related, event related things. Per, yeah. per P, potential. Potential. So the electrical potential. The electrical yeah. potential. And basically what you can see here is that, yes. so the 300, it's like this window right here. So you can see that there's this, there's the, a difference in the curves in the Mediterranean group and not so much in the, I was probably blocking the camera, and not so much in the placebo group there. So uh, at, at that okay. 300 millisecond window, okay, there's at something the Okay, 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 I see, I see. So, so okay, so at the 300 millisecond window, there's pre and post, there's a bigger gap here. Exactly, Than yep. in the placebo. So it's, okay. there's a bigger gap, and it's what it's sli slightly doing too, is it's the, the, the latency or the, the speed at which the P300 sort of ramps up is getting quicker in Mediterranean, the Mediterranean group compared to the placebo group. So that's, that's what we, so they're, sure. they're engaging their control mechanisms, their attention mechanisms okay. faster they're engaging in, the, the control in, mechanisms in the, faster. in the trial compared to okay. the, the other group. Yeah. And now okay. this is happening in a very different part of the brain. So this is showing sort of a top down view of the brain. This is the front, this is the back. We see this more in what we call sort of parietal regions, posterior parietal areas. So we think that you know, we didn't really have the power to do sort of modeling of the frontal parietal interactions, but we think that these are probably sort of, inter, you know, there's sort of interplay between that frontal theta rhythm that's then driving what's going on back here at this, this sort of, because that was at 200 milliseconds, this is a little later at 300 milliseconds. So there's probably the, the sort of interaction between the frontal and, and parietal regions that are, is important. Okay, and then what did that and that interaction is signaling? Well, that so this we think this is another marker of sustained attention. So if you have this, okay. you know, the, the bigger and faster your P300, your parietal lobe is engaged, especially for visual spatial, that's kind of what the parietal lobe does, these, this visual, visual spatial, spatial attention. Yeah. If, you know, if we had used a verbal task, it would be different the areas of the brain. The more engaged that is, yeah, okay. Then the more you're likely attending to, to the, the visual the spatial target. challenge that you're focused exactly. on. Exactly, yep. Okay, and that's why it's, yeah, the parietal in this case. Yeah, yep. okay, okay, okay. The brain stuff, yeah, I mean, the, the, we're really interested in the neural mechanisms, but it, it, it gets really complicated very quickly, but, um, um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so. yeah it makes it a lot of sense. It tracks with the behavior yeah. results pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. You, you will see the areas of the brain engaged um, and focused. That's right. what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so and many contributors just, and colleagues, shout out. <laughs> this is nice to show Min this, Su actually. Kim, yeah, Jordy but, Martin, Lindsay Martin, Sasha Skinner, so Joshua Volpani. Yeah. yeah, Abby Spade, Jim Stern. Zinga, shout out, shout out, everyone, <laughs> shout out, shout outs all around for all of the people involved. Yeah, yeah it is yeah. nice to show because you know, again, for you know, over four years, and this is the type of you know team that it takes to do this it type does. of study. It's yeah, it's yeah. a huge amount of coordination. So I, you know, and again, I, you know, and, this, and our participants, of course. And shout out to those the are, participants. Those, those were our. This is one of our older adults. So this is a study that we were actually just now this wrapping up. This is the eighteen-year-old. The eighteen-year-old. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, we're, uh, this is from our current study that we're just now wrapping up and doing data analysis on. Another, um, another study. Yeah, we did a much larger study in cool. healthy older adults, 60 oh, to did? 80 year olds. Cool. Yeah. Whoa. So we, we're, we're just finishing that, uh, looking at the data. It cool. looks pretty good. It looks like we actually have nice. a, a, at least a partial replication of what we saw in young adults. A world in, of, in these older of adults. Grandma and grandmas and grandpas with increased sustained exactly. attention. Well, well, and this is a, I mean, that's a population that, you know, they have challenges yeah. to their attention yeah. anyway. So and I think we think this could be really useful. You could, actually, yeah. you could actually end up saving, you know, potentially even like billions of dollars on healthcare expenses by people not needing to go in for neurodegenerative treatments. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah, through just something as um, cool and democratized as digital um, neurotherapeutics. Right. That's awesome yeah David, I, that's so cool we yeah. we think it's a huge new you know avenue that that you know not completely unexplored but the digital therapeutics a lot of what's out there now hasn't been sort of validated to the level that we're doing it at, at neuroscape so that's where you know i think that um there's room for improvement um there's massive potential for these digital therapeutics but there are also you know there are a lot of you know there's a lot of overhype, exaggerated hype, uh, exaggerated claims where they, people don't often have as much of the science to back it up. So that's where we're trying to really sort of figure out, you know, at a very um, sort of minute level what's going on. What are the mechanisms that are driving this? And, you know, what, what are the aspects of the training that are more ben most beneficial? And then how do we tailor it to individuals so that not every, you know, it's not like a pill that, everybody takes the same pill and it's supposed to, you know, have the same effect. We know that isn't how medicine works, but it's how, we don't, we know that's not how the body works, but it's how medicine works, right, up until now. So the idea behind this is tailor it to the individual much yeah. more. Yeah, to way more tailored to the individual, not just, yeah, throwing pharmaceuticals in people's throats and hoping for the best. Right. This is an actual tailored experience. Plus, it's also crazy that this is applicable for not only, you know, young people to focus on sustained attention and be able to execute what their dreams are better, but it's also for, and not need to, like, dose up on pharmaceuticals to deal with their, you know, Which ADHD is a huge or whatever. problem, right? Huge, growing it's a huge concern. problem, yeah. Yeah. growing concern. Um, and then also on the older side of, of folks as well to mm -hmm. um, not need to go in for dementia or any other types of yeah, yeah. degenerative diseases. And you can actually, uh, maybe you want to do something new in terms of art or music or science later in your life. And you yeah, can absolutely. sustain your focus better on that than just yeah, clicking on some uh, channel that yeah, is yeah. Yeah, right. just sapping away the energy at the later points in your life. So, yep. so that's kind of the future of neurotech is these, these digital neurotherapeutics. I think it's, it's a big, big component aspect. of it. Yeah. yeah. I think that there are other things too, you know, that, that, that we're exploring as well. Neurostimulation, yeah. um, you know, neurofeedback in general, you know, we talked about that. We were, you know, at some point we'd like to develop a version of this that is driven, the closed loop is driven by neural signals as opposed to... That's great. You know, yeah. again, we, the, the question remains open how much of the introspection is important to it, but once we have that capability, we could actually ask that question. Maybe they're good for different populations. Some people might, I mean, I have a, whole, I have a really difficult time with seated meditation and, and focusing on my breath. It's really difficult for me. So maybe I could get much more benefit from something that's just helping me relax and get into a state where, you know, my body feels better and my mind is more calm, even though, you know, I'm not pushing it myself. So, yeah, probably this isn't for everybody, you know, and like you said, like the Muse headset isn't for everybody, but maybe yeah. that would tap into, you know, a different population who benefit will benefit in a different way. Yeah, it's interesting seeing how many of the players are at play here. Like, could Metatrain, could the license go into Headspace or call more like Sam Harris's app? Yeah, or, yeah, I don't, or, or I don't could, see why not. Yeah. yeah, it could be complementary. It could be it's complimentary. not going to displace 
a lot of what these play, what these other companies it's are doing. It's complimentary, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. like they'll have a little drop down for sustained attention exercise yeah, or exactly. yeah, open yeah. heart. And instead of, um, they'll have a closed loop system, your closed loop system right, there. Right. I like that a lot. Muse could use it, all these different, yeah. And then they could also do the portion of the sensing through EEG for yeah. determining if you're focused or not too. Yeah. So then it's yeah. not self-reporting. Mm -hmm. Could you smash cool. all these together? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's get this done. Like, let's get this done. This is awesome. Let's get this democratized. Let's get this licensed and out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I hope um, and if people watching want to, to do that or share it with people that want to um, to do that. I would we would love to cool. see that yeah. happen. Um, and if you do want to go and you know check out David's link in the bio and reach out to him via email and just inquire because that's a that's such a good way to get this out there faster. Um, Okay, let's let's wrap on um, a couple points. Do we cover okay. what we? Needed? Yeah, I think, I think I'm we got into a lot so of the too. details. Yeah, that yeah, was great. That was cool. great. Yeah. I liked it too. A mm -hmm. um, couple quick questions on the way out. Um, the first one is, uh, David, do we come from somewhere else into these flesh vehicles to play on Earth? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. No, I think that um, there we don't know, right? But there seems to be a lot of evidence that the, the, our bodies are put together in a way that you know what our mind and our cognition is is this emergent property right that we, it it's kind of a lot of luck that things came together totally. the way they did um and, and you know but it's not just yeah i mean coming from somewhere else it's not to say that there aren't others like us or you know a different form of us somewhere else so who knows but you, yeah. it's just you think it's most Occam's razor just emerged from as like a, that's from the planet my my you know based on what I know you know I'm not yeah. you know an expert on sort of evolutionary theory yeah, or that yeah. sort of thing but humans from, are I have studied it yeah the planet. I mean yeah, yeah exactly yeah. I think that's yeah. most Occam's razor right. yeah yeah some very spiritual people are like oh we come from source and we come through these bodies for school on the planet sure it's which kind of interesting it, you know there yeah. yeah and you can't refute that so you know there yeah. it's not you know I don't have evidence against that poke it as, poke again it as a scientist I, yeah. yeah I mean yeah. it th that the spiritual thing is I mean they're they're important they're very very important ramifications of that but those are those are questions that are just not falsifiable. So they're just yeah. we have to live with some unknowns, right? Yeah, I think that that's in the the realm of that. Yeah, science giving some space to spirituality and like testing that is well, very interesting. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and I mean again, that's like you know what what we've done here with with Meditrain is create sort of a new digital version of meditation. But a yeah. lot of the research on sort of Eastern practices, there you know these are you know it's all been proof of what people have, you know, known for ages and ages, you know, or, or have suspected for ages and ages that, you know, we're just trying to um, quantify it and, and put scientific data to it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We talked about that before. Yeah, the show. exactly. Yeah. 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 What's the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, most Last question. What's the okay. most beautiful thing in the world? Um, Well, I would have to say nature in general. I'm trying to come up with like one at one example of nature, but I just think that being in nature in so many different, you know, we're, we're in California here. There's, there's so much um, about being in natural environments that's restorative that, you know, I think it's the most, those are the most beautiful places that, that I spend time on this world anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on, David. Absolutely, this been, yeah. It's been a huge pleasure. Yes, thank it's been you. great. Thank you. Thank you Anytime. for all your work with yeah. Metatrain. Yeah. And we're so, keeping, continuing on. We've got lots more to do, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We love Neuroscape. We would love, you know, everyone, check out the links in the bio, because Neuroscape has so many different We do, lot, I mean, this is just one very minimal slice of what yeah. we do, yeah. And let's keep featuring more of Neuroscape's technologies on the show. It's a very super synergistic it's a good outlet. what's happening. Yeah, yeah it's a great us. outlet. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. Love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and get this licensed out. Go and get MetaTrain licensed out as soon as we can. Check out the full paper in Nature as well. That's down there. Go follow David on Twitter and Neuroscape on Twitter for more of the information that they'll be releasing soon. 
and have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about the future of neurotechnology and these closed loop uh, digital meditations that can improve our sustained attention. Shout out to Ron Vagas for producing and directing. Thank you very much. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Support simulation as well. Our link's in the bio. We love you very much, and we'll see you soon. Peace.